everyone, I hope you're doing really well. Uh, welcome to another teacher vlog video. Um, I'm going to be doing some lesson planning for year 11 today. If you saw my other teacher vlog that I put up, I think it was two weeks ago, um, I lesson planned for year 10 uh, for topic one in biology, so if you want to have a look at that you can. Um, but today I'm planning topic five. Um, and I actually teach four different year 11 classes. So I teach a couple who are sort of middle ability um, and within that class there are students who are really, really able and some students who need a bit of support. So I need to consider how I'm going to differentiate for them and make sure that the pace of the lesson suits everyone. Um, and then the other two classes that I teach for year 11 are lower ability sets. So those are students who need things broken down a lot more, need the pace to be a bit slower, need more visual and imagery. Um, so when I'm lesson planning today, I'm going to try and cater for this particular cohort of students um, and give me enough freedom and you know opportunities to um, tweak things and change them as I see um, fit. Because I think the, the, the issue with planning beforehand is you're you're anticipating that you know exactly what students need and then comes lesson one and you realize actually all of the future lessons I've planned um, isn't really suited to, to this group of students. So I don't want to plan too far ahead. I'm just going to plan the first three to four lessons just to give me enough, enough room for the first couple of weeks to get myself organised and, and be on top of things without feeling overwhelmed. So that's the plan today. Um, so I'm going to show you a few things behind the scenes in terms of what tasks I choose to do, how I put together my PowerPoints, um, opportunities for differentiation, websites that I use. So I'll show you all of that and I hope you find it useful if you're planning your lessons and if you want a little bit of insight as to how someone else does it. Also, I'm feeling really great today. Um, I've not been feeling amazing, to be honest. Uh, I don't know what it is. I think it's because I really do miss being at school and I miss the routine of work. Um, and so I think it hit me that we've still got a couple of weeks left and just sort of like feeling like I have all of these things to do um, but not really any drive or motivation to get them done so I'm hoping that today um, will change that feeling definitely a good start to the day I started with some stretching I did a little bit of meditation there's this really really great app by uh, Sam Harris called waking up you should check it out if you want something a little bit different to um, Calm and Headspace, which are two other apps that I've tried before for meditation. But my brother's been using this app for quite some time and he raves about it. So um, he's given me a subscription for a particular part of, of the app um, that I'm really looking forward to using. So it was a really great start to the morning. Got ready, had some breakfast, I've got some coffee, and now I'm here at my desk and I'm about to start work. So nice day and also it's a bit grey outside which you know kill me <laughs> but I actually really love um, sort of like a greyish weather to work when it's too hot and too sunny it's just too bright for me to focus on my laptop um, even if I shut the curtains it just doesn't feel great so I think the universe is on my side and I'm feeling really up for it so let's start to plan a topic uh, one of the first things I'd recommend that you do is that you access the textbook online or 
you know, whatever your school uses to find out the learning objectives. It might be the schemes of work, for example. And I think that should be the starting point because you need to be able to identify what learning objectives are going to be covered in each lesson. And then once you know what those learning objectives are, you're essentially applying the backwards planning model. So you're starting with what the outcome is. So what is it that students need to know? And then you're backwards planning because you're identifying what they need to do in order to be able to achieve that learning outcome. So what I would do next after getting all of the learning objectives from, I get it from the textbook and assigning them to different lessons, I would do that on my medium term plan so you can check that out in one of my videos on my channel. Um, the second thing I do is I find what available resources there are already, so there's a ton of quick quizzes, there are lots of activity worksheets, there are PowerPoints already made um, through the textbook um, online website, but also my school has a lot of resources already made. So I just have a quick browse, look through things and identify anything that I might need. I personally like to save stuff in a hard drive, so I connect that to my laptop um, and then I can just easily um, skim through those rather than having to open everything um, over again. Um, so I like to, to save the things that I really enjoy, so things like revision maths or summary sheets or topic um, question worksheets, exam style questions, there are particular types of of tasks that I really enjoy having always ready to go so I can just screenshot something or copy paste it and then it makes it much much easier to use when I'm actually lesson planning. So after I have the learning objectives and then a, a bunch of free resources um, ready to, to go, I then either copy paste a previous lesson that I've used so I can use that template or I have a template that I use all the time for lessons and then, then I just add to that. And the reason for doing this is it just saves time um, in terms of formatting the different fonts, colours, the layout of your PowerPoint slides, because you, if you have to recreate that every single time, it's just going to be really time consuming. So copy paste something that you've used before or spend about half an hour just creating a template that you can always use. Um, and then start adding to that PowerPoint um, the lesson that you want to teach your students. Now some of you will have to write a lesson plan for, the, for every lesson that you teach. My school doesn't ask me to do that, I just lesson plan sort of by brainstorming in my head or trial and error, so deciding okay I want to do this as the main task and then I go back and decide what's the starter that students need to do, what's a suitable plenary. Um, so I think that's sort of how I go about trying to figure out what the lesson should be and then at the end I make any tweaks that I need to make in terms of differentiation or adding any pictures or diagrams um, to sort of really enhance that dual coding um, element of, of teaching and learning. And if you don't know what dual coding is, it essentially means where you're trying to put together an image and text together so that students can learn more effectively rather than separating those two. So if you have on one slide in your PowerPoint an image and then you move on to the next slide where it explains that image and text, that is overloading um, their sort of cognitive memory and students might feel overwhelmed and not really understand what's happening because they're separating those two pieces of information. Whereas if you embed it together, so if you've got the picture and the text all in one, students are more likely to remember it because they just use their visual memory. Um, so I like to use that at the end, I sort of try to figure out where, where there are opportunities for me to, to use it. So here's a little example of a task that is a discussion-based task. So you can see here that I've got a little um, prompt for them. And I think what's really useful in this situation is to actually plan ahead uh, the questions that you want to include. So obviously I will reiterate this um, verbally out loud in the lesson. Um, and I will sort of, as I'm walking around the room, direct them to particular students. Um, but I think the, the idea of planning ahead your questions is really important because it's going to give you a clear idea of what you want to get out of that discussion and how long the discussion should, should take place. So in this um, type of, of activity, it's really straightforward that it's just a recall a task. They just need to remember the different types of non-communicable diseases. I'm using imagery to show them, so they've got um, 
sickle cell anemia here, they've got deficiency diseases, the example here is rickets, but they can be prompted as an extension to try to remember the other types. Then we've got liver disease uh, from alcohol and we have um, smoking, the effect on smoking on lungs, but we also have the effect of smoking on the cardiovascular disease, um, so the lining of the arteries, veins, um, as an example here of breaking down the tissue and increasing the, the fat deposits. So there's, I think the idea of including imagery for a discussion-based task is really important. And then collating those ideas after a few minutes. So this task, for example, would be a task that I would give students about three minutes, three to four minutes to discuss. Um, and they're essentially answering what are each of these and what causes them and then what impact do they have on, on health. Um, with some extensions and then I will just go through the fact that it's a genetic disease It's a malnutrition deficiency disease and alcohol which contributes to, contributes to liver disease and then smoking Which contributes to lung and cardiovascular disease So this is an example here of dual coding where you're associating the word with the image So it's not like I've got the images on one slide and then I move to the next slide and I list them as four types of non-communicable diseases I'm assimilating the information to the image that they've now already primed into their brain. So now if I needed to do a quick recall task of what are the four types of non-communicable dis diseases, they can quickly list that it will be genetic, malnutrition, um, liver and cardiovascular. And so then by doing that retrieval, um, I can, if someone's struggling, I can say, can you remember those images? Do you remember what the hands represented? Or do you remember what the little blood cell represented? And that can be a really easy prompt because you can't really prompt using what the actual answers are, right? So I think including images is a really great way to build from discussion into retrieval, so into memory practice. So something else to always make sure you've got in your PowerPoint slides for the different tasks is to make sure you've got the answers for them. Um, and I think it just makes it much easier because as you've planned for students to do the task, you can then make sure that you're spending your time supporting them rather than trying to remind yourself what those answers should be. Because even the best of us, um, at times we forget subject knowledge, we forget information. And some of the questions that we might ask students do need a little bit of thought behind them or might need a calculator or whatever it might be. And I think try to do all of that legwork before the lesson so you're not having to spend your time doing that rather than supporting students. The other thing I think is quite useful is to try and find opportunities to do some extension and challenge questions. So I mentioned before that I've got um, two of my year 11 classes who um, have mixed ability so there's students there that are quite able and will finish the task before others and so they'll need a little bit more of a challenge task to get on with. So I'm just going to show you an example of a couple of slides where I've done that uh, so you can see. Okay so here you can see that my students need to uh, do some calculations so I've given them uh, the formula there for them to write in their books and then some questions here for them to calculate. Um, I don't need them to write this in their exercise books, I just like to include little things like this um, that they can use when they're reviewing this PowerPoint at home because I often upload my resources onto Google Classroom to support them with doing some revision but also for anyone doing some home learning and not able to come into school because of social distancing and social isolation um, this can be a really useful way of setting up the PowerPoints but because it's a calculation task I don't want to be doing those calculations within the lesson so I just have the answers ready to go and in terms of using this as a differentiation task it's really easy to get students to rearrange them in terms of um, who has a higher BMI or who is going to or make predictions in terms of who is going to be obese. Um, now some students will have the opportunity to do an extension challenge activity and generally speaking any type of evaluation or thinking hard or um, you know comparing type of tasks are really good ones to include as an extension task and this is a great opportunity here because it's also going to support me with the transition into the next slide which I know that a lot of us can struggle with transitioning between uh, different uh, parts of the lesson.
So here I need to get them to consider what the advantages and disadvantages of using BMI to measure body fat um, are. And hopefully that then should support students with identifying that. Obviously here is a little guideline um, for them, but with identifying that in fact, it's not always certain where the fat is. Um, so with BMI, that mass could be lighter for someone who has less muscle but higher fat because fat weighs less than, than muscle. Um, whereas someone who is heavier might have less fat because they have more muscle and that's not necessarily accounted for in the BMI but can be counter, um, counteracted with measuring abdominal fat through waist to hip ratio. So that's an easy way of um, ensuring that a challenge or an extension task also supports you with a transition task. And then here I, you can see that I've done it again. So students need to answer these two questions. So how does this compare to BMI and what does the graph tell you? But the thing with the graph is most students should be able to appreciate that there's a correlation, a positive correlation um, with the increase in BMI and the increase of waist to hip ratio in resulting to um, a higher percentage of people developing cardiovascular disease. But now there's also opportunity um, to extend this by focusing on these two because actually BMI is different to um, waist to hip ratio in that someone who has a low BMI seems to have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease than someone who has this range. And so here we can talk a little bit about malnutrition and being underweight and how that puts um, stress on your body um, without it necessarily meaning that you've got, um, you know, a higher um, fat content. So the risk of cardiovascular disease in um, a low BMI could be a point for discussion for, you know, challenging their thinking for those who, you know, might be able and, and ready to do that. So that's a quick example uh, just to show you. I'm just going to get lunch prepared and then while that's cooking, um, I'm going to get some IGTV videos filmed for my Instagram. So um, that that's ready to upload in the in the next few weeks. If you want to go and check those out, they're on my Instagram account, link down below. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of reading, just sort of like switch my eyes off um, from the screen, and, um, and then have some food, and then go back to it. So I'm just getting lunch ready, and I'm going to pop um, a sweet potato in the oven. I'll cook some more just so that um, I don't waste the energy of the oven. And then I'm just going to put together like a little chickpea salad. Um, I love. I love these chickpeas, they're nice and big. Um, so yeah, I'll put all of that together in a little salad and then use that on top of the baked sweet potato. So I just brought you to the light. You can see that I mixed all of these ingredients together. The tomatoes from the garden smelled amazing. Just put a little bit of vegan mayo and now it's ready to put on top of the sweet potato. Um, I don't normally put lettuce, but the lettuce was going, um, was going off. So I just thought to throw it in here um, so that I wouldn't have any food waste. Yeah, really easy and super quick to put together. Um, and it doesn't really take up much of your time in the day when you're at home because the sweet potato cooks in the oven and then you just throw this together in five minutes and then you're ready to go. wanted to quickly show you guys some different ways um, of including AFL in your lessons, especially when the content is quite, you know, information heavy and it might be a bit teacher-led. So for example, this is the starter task that I got, I'm going to get my class to do. So how do you think diseases are spread? And they have to come up with a spider diagram. Um, and then this is sort of like the visual answer. So there are five different ways but now I have to link that to the different diseases. So I'm going to give them this task, it's a grid with some questions, so eight questions in total. And as I talk them through the different information, 
they are going to answer the questions. So I've got the answers available uh, for anyone doing this at home, but also then as a self-assessment. So as I talk through the information, they are going to have to find which question uh, that information applies to and then answer the question straight away. So we're doing the task as we're learning it. So I think that's a good way of um, making it a little bit more student-led. Um, and then I'm going to follow that up with a true or false. So this is quite straightforward to create and then you can just um, color code it immediately. Then a different way of doing some uh, formative assessment within the lesson is something like this. Now I've spoken quite a lot about grid retrieval type tasks and here's another way you can use them. So you can make a smaller grid, have some questions and then in this case I'm not going to get my students to write down the answers but you could. Um, so I'm actually going to get them to talk to their partners about it because they spent the previous slides writing information in their exercise books. So I want to make sure that they have the opportunity to verbalise um, the information that they've learned. So they're going to be doing that. So answering a combination of six questions that form two straight lines across the grid. So that should be quite fun for them. I'm just about to have a little afternoon snack. So I love these uh, five chocolate tiffin. Um, they're really, really nice, quite sort of like substantial. So um, I only have these when I'm a little bit peckish and hungry and I'm craving something sweet. Um, and then I'm obsessed with this tea at the moment. Um, it's a Moroccan mint tea and I absolutely love the box. So, so cute. Um, but yeah, really refreshing. Um, and I like to have some herbal tea throughout the day rather than just always having coffee. planning three lessons for year 11 actually in the end it, it's nine to ten lessons uh, so I think that was a really good use of my time today I hope you found all of the tips useful um, in terms of seeing the you know behind the scenes of how I think about lesson planning and some of the strategies that I use if you've liked the video then give it a thumbs up and um, please do subscribe as well I'd love to have your support and if you do want to see more teacher vlogs then leave me a comment letting me know what you'd like to see so I can keep that in mind when I make uh, more in the future that is it for today guys have a lovely joyous beautiful day and I will see you next week bye <laughs>